if it's going to be able to serve the planet and whatever else, then you really need it to be linear in scale to some degree, right? Like you add more compute, you add more resources. And if you've got double the amount of resources that you had before, then you could potentially scale twice as much as you, as you could before, whether that's good transactions, bad transactions, whatever it is, right? The previous sharding attempts that we have seen up until this point with kind of layer twos or kind of even how near approaches sharding, um, those type of sharding as reflected to the user kind of say an optimism shard or a uh, polygon shard are known to the users which make that confusing not only from a user experience but also as a developer experience and radix's point of view is to enable sharding to get that further scalability down the line but ultimately have it integrated such that it's at the software level where users and engineers, it's kind of opaque to them. To to a, to a naive observer, a user or a developer, all they just see is I, I send something in and then I get something out and I don't have to worry about where I'm sending it to or what it's doing. Well, today I'm super excited to be joined by Dan, one of the co-founders of Radex. Dan, thank you so much for joining me. I We were just talking briefly I feel like I've interviewed quite a few people, uh, technical co-founders in the space, uh, but I have not really dug into Radix. Uh, on Twitter or X, I'll tweet something technical and the Radix community will ultimately come into my tweets and say, why are you looking at Radix? So really excited to dive into uh, what you're building and ultimately kind of your journey uh, into Web3. Yeah, cool. Thanks for having me on. Um, so... A bit of background, I guess. Um, so my, my journey started a long time ago um, in 2012 um, when I really started to think about what, what what is Bitcoin, what is it doing, what does it mean for um, the world as it as it as it happens. Um, initially, I was more interested in the technical aspects from a kind of computer science consensus point of view, right? Um, how is this doing what it's doing in such a way that, that it's permissionless, which hadn't really been done before, um, so that you could have like these kind of non-third party permissionless consensus mechanisms. Um, and then from there, kind of dug into that rabbit hole and then I got an appreci appreciation for the economic aspects and how disruptive that could be as well. Um, and just kind of went down the Bitcoin rabbit hole for quite some time. Um, but being the kind of technical engineer that I am, it was a case of take it apart and see what's, you know, not optimal or what problems is this going to run into if it wants to, you know, potentially scale to the planet and stuff. Um, and highlighted a bunch of things that was like, okay, this is going to be, it's difficult to scale this thing and you're going to get like centralization of like mining power and, you know, the volatility of the currency might end up being a problem long term if it doesn't stabilize. And all these are kind of like a short list of stuff. It was like, mm, yeah, this might be a problem. So um, initially kind of thought, well, maybe I can look at solving some of these from the perspective of Bitcoin. Um, but after a little while of, of doing that, kind of became apparent that the kind of, you know, the foundation of, of Bitcoin it's very difficult to scale um, and difficult to alleviate some of the issues around, you know, decentralization and all that kind of stuff. So ultimately thought, well, new file, let's go. Let's, let's, let's start from scratch with the fundamentals of Bitcoin and that whole philosophy and ideology and try and, you know, build something else like a, you know, a, a kind of a second generation, if you like, that solves some of those, um, some of those issues. Um, and so that's kind of where my journey started and, you know, scaling these kind of systems and scaling them with, you know, so they're responsive, right? So that you're not having to wait 60 minutes for a transaction. And, you know, what does the, what does the scaling strategy look like? What does that model look like? What, how do you preserve things like liveness and safety and different scalability um, architectures and, what about usability and developer experience and all these other things, you know, you start to, you start to go down that rabbit hole and that rabbit hole goes real deep. So 
Um, spent a long time just really under the radar, just researching for a long time, just, you know, on my own with a small community that had kind of, you know, gathered around me, interested in what I was doing um, in the coding cave, as they called it, for a number of years. And then started to make some real progress with scaling solutions and kind of nail them to the wall and say, okay, that's definitely a component. That's definitely a component. This is a component to to preserve decentralization. This is a component that preserves this particular thing that we need. Um, and then start to scale the project out to, you know, bring more people in, engineers, and and then, you know, full on like C-suite and marketing department and all that kind of stuff. Um, and so over the past couple of years, our scalability solution has been peer reviewed and passed its peer review published in a pit in a, in a journal um and loads of other kind of interesting stuff around our smart contract language and the developer experience user experience it's all kind of complete stack built from the ground up basically amazing definitely appreciate all the background context and kind of that journey you you mentioned some limitations ultimately discovered by bitcoin but Maybe more broadly, what do you feel like are the largest limitations to actually scaling blockchains from either a networking side, consensus, uh, kind of the virtual machine layer, storage? Where do you ultimately see the bottlenecks arising and why did you feel like a new kind of layer one ecosystem was necessary to get that off the ground? Yeah, so from from the... Early days, really, my kind of idea of a scalability solution was sharding. So I was investigating sharding solutions back in 2013. Um, I think I was the only person investigating sharding solutions back in 2013. Um, and so it always kind of, you know, monolithic systems never scale, right? Like you look at, you know, Google with all of its data, it's not all stored on a single machine and it's not replicated across, you know, the same data, the same monolithic hunk of data isn't, isn't stored on a bunch of replicas in its entirety. It's, you know, it's split up, it's chopped up. It, there's an addressing model, a state model that, you know, addresses what, um, on which machine and the giant data center this piece of data is on and stuff. So thinking kind of, you know, forward looking in terms of cryptocurrency, um, if you want to be able to serve 8 billion people and all their fridges and toasters and phones and everything else, then it seems like the only, the only real viable option. Right. Um, and the early scaling solutions were, you know, I was thinking about were, were, were kind of primitive in terms of, okay, well um, you could have this particular shard for, for these kind of transactions and you can have this particular shard for, for this kind of transaction, which is, you know, like subnets, which what AVAX is doing, right? Uh, or there you have side chains and all these other different things. Um, but then thinking about that trajectory of sharding, it's like, yeah, but what if, what if these two different transactions need to interact with, with each other? Then you've got cross shard communication complexity and issues around safety and liveness and rollbacks and all these things. So maybe that approach isn't the right approach. So that was like the nth iteration of, okay, new file, let's start again, lessons learned. Um, there's been about five or six different iterations where pretty much built an entire kind of solution and then understood that, okay, this is a step closer, but then there's still these issues that don't really make it viable in, in terms of, you know, all transactions can interact with all different applications and dApps and you can have all these kind of very exotic transactions that do multiple things, you know, composability and all that kind of stuff. Very hard to do that if you, you know, side chains or or sovereign chains and subnets and all this kind of stuff. And even more difficult to do if your scaling solution is like L2s, right? You're getting fractured liquidity and fractured application state and all this kind of stuff. Um, and so the kind of the approach that we found the took was, okay, well, let's just have a kind of, a unified scaling model where you have shards and you have state that is kind of, you know, distributed around all these different places. But from the point of view of the state model and from the point of view of the execution engines and from the point of view of the users and the developers, they have no idea that it's sharded, right? So all of the sharding is actually abstracted away and anything can live anywhere. Um, and the key to being able to do that is actually, it's, it's not really anything to do with your, 
your kind of practical sharding model. It's more about how how is the state represented in the network, right? If there's you know an application that's storing some variables and storing some data, how is that represented in the network? How is it de determined where that is stored? Um, what what kind of address space does that look like? Is it a fixed address space and all this kind of stuff, right? It's more about the, your state model as opposed to your actual sharding model. Um, and that took quite a while to figure out, but then it was one of those, ah, that's how you do it. Um, and it turns out yeah. it seems like it works pretty well. <laughs> so maybe just to re-articulate for the audience, ultimately, as kind of networks grow, I mean, you need to do more computation or kind of more yeah. bandwidth. And your thought process was always if we hit some level of scale, you'll need essentially machines that are too large to be bounded by one system, essentially requiring for sharding down the line, kind of modeling off what has happened in traditional kind of web two companies, but the previous sharding attempts that we have seen up until this point with kind of layer twos or kind of even how near approaches sharding, um, those type of sharding as reflected to the user kind of say an optimism shard or a uh, polygon mm -hmm. shard are known to the users, which make that confusing, not only from a user experience, but also as a developer experience. And Radex's point of view is to enable sharding to get that further scalability down the line, but ultimately have it integrated such that it's at the software level where users and engineers, it's kind of yeah, opaque they, to they don't know. There's, you know to to a, to a naive observer, a user or a developer, all they just see is I, I send something in and then I get something out and I don't have to worry about where I'm sending it to or what it's doing. Uh, I don't have to be thinking about, okay, if my application fails, do I have to deal with rollbacks, which is something else that uh, we have in our sharding model that I, I, isn't anywhere else, which is like atomicity, like strong atomicity, right? Either all of this stuff completes and executes and terminates correctly or none of this stuff um leaves any residual changes left on the ledger right um and the reason that that's important is because if you don't have that atomicity then your your failure cases become a large overhead right and when you have a large overhead that maybe gets out of control and and an adversary may see that as a, as a potential attack vector, right? Okay, if I can make lots of transactions fail, then I can make the overheads of the network grow so that it doesn't scale as well as it, as, as it does when um, everything is operated normally. Those overheads always kind of plateau your, your potential scale, right? So like if you've got failures or even, if, even in some scaling systems where scaling models where everything's going fine, the overheads eventually creep right the scaling solution isn't linear it's sublinear so eventually you hit this plateau um so another thing that very strongly drove our our scaling uh model and how we we're thinking about it was if it's going to be able to serve the planet and whatever else then you really need it to be linear in scale to some degree right like you add more compute you add more resources and if you've got double the amount of resources that you had before then you could potentially scale twice as much as you as you could before whether that's good transactions bad transactions whatever it is right um you need to make sure that those the the overheads are are linear with with um uh, in, in comparison to to the compute that you've got which is something else that we have too which uh, i don't think we see you see in any other any of the scaling solutions, the overheads always seem to eventually plateau, which is one of the main reasons why we we went through so many iterations was because, okay, this isn't quite linear, right? It's like, it's it's 2% below linear, but when, you, when you're pushing billions of transactions across this thing, that 2% matters, right? Or that 3% of overhead that you don't want, it starts to matter eventually because, uh, you know, it, it, it accumulates and then you hit a plateau and you get into diminishing returns which is what we didn't want. Yeah. So to my knowledge, the only other two blockchains, at least today, that are pursuing like an intra-validator sharding where it is is opaque to the users and really handled on the software side are going to be Solana and Sui. 
how I guess maybe kind of going through like the core bottlenecks of blockchain architecture, I think you were talking a little bit about like the consensus design and like the overhead there. Maybe we'd love to just tap into starting with consensus. How does Radax ultimately approach that? How does it differ from kind of some of the more integrated chains that are all to all or avalanche with like probabilistic mm-hmm. pulling? Uh, what unique things has the Radex community done to enable linear scale? So um, there's actually two consensus mechanisms, right? So you have your kind of traditional um, consensus within a set of validators, yeah. So and 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 that can that can technically be anything. It could be PBFT, it could be hot stuff, it could be you know, proof of work based, whatever, right? Um, and then what sits above that is the second layer of consensus called Cerberus, which handles all of the cross shard stuff. Um, and so your local consensus just, okay, we've got this transaction and we're going to process it. Do we all agree that we processed it within our particular group uh, and we're happy with the result of, of what the consensus was? Yes, we are. No, we're not. Whatever. And then the Cerberus layer on top um, that deal that handles all of the, the cross shard consensus, but it does it in such a in such a way where you get these ephemeral validator sets, right? So, if we had a, have a network of say a hundred shards with a hundred different validator sets, um, and there was a transaction that touched three of them, then the Cerberus consensus piece orchestrates um, an ephemeral um, validator set, which includes the validators from those three sets that this transaction touches. And that's completely independent consensus process to anything else they might be doing. So those validators in those three sets, they'll be you know, in, included in many different um, ephemeral validator sets, um, processing all manner of different kinds, kinds of transactions, right? Um, and the, the reason that you need the local is so that that shard can agree on, on what was processed, right? For safety and for liveness and stuff. Um, and so that uh, they can agree an order on which, okay, between us, we're, we're in all these different validator sets that represent all of these different transactions. Um, and some of these transactions are dependent on each other. Some of them are not the ones that are independent. We don't really need a total order for them, but the ones that are dependent on each other, like if they are all touching the same, uh, smart contract, right. Uh, and that smart contract resides within one of those particular validator sets, then those validators have to come to an agreement on what order are we going to process these transactions in that mutates this this piece of state for this smart contract that we as a shard are responsible for, right? What's the order we're going to we're going to process that in? And then those three validator sets, they come to you know they execute, they create some proofs of execution for correctness and all that kind of stuff. Um, and then those validator sets exchange a compact representation of, of, of what they have executed in terms of that transaction. Um, and they attach a vote as well, um, uh, you know, a kind of aggregated signature um, of all the validators on who voted and, or who rejected. Um, and if, uh, if you have two thirds majority across all the validator sets that say, yeah, we executed this and all of the execution proofs are the same hash, then the transaction gets accepted. If one of the validator sets doesn't have a majority, then it gets failed everywhere. Now, it's, it's atomic because all the three validator sets that are responsible for some piece of state within that transaction, they're kind of semi-synchronized in terms of when they're doing the processing, right? So it's like a multi, it's like a multi-phase. So the, multiple, the, the first phase is, are we all ready? Yeah, we're all ready to execute, okay. Let's swap any state that everybody needs for this execution. So I might be responsible for some piece of state. You're responsible for another piece of state. But so we can both execute um, so that we can check each other's execution output because I don't want to just blindly trust you or what, what you say, right? I want to execute it too. You need to send me the state inputs that I need and I need to send you the state inputs that you need. And then when we have them, we can both execute. We can both vote on the execution. Was it good or bad? Then we exchange these proofs. And you compare my proof to what you executed. I compare your proof to what I executed. And if they match and we're in agreement that we can we can uh, apply these state changes, then the next phase of consensus is then a commit. But before that commit happens, nothing's been nothing's been changed on Ledger, right? So if you don't hear from me or 
I don't hear from you or your proof doesn't match mine, then I fail. You have to fail because you won't, you won't get a, um, uh, a commit quorum signature from me to say that I've actually committed. So uh, this transaction just gets, gets aborted. And that gives you the, the atomic, atomicness across, across commits, across shards, which is very important because if, if it's not atomic, um, if it's probabilistic in some way, right. Um, then there are edge cases where I can convince you that I've committed it, but I actually don't, and I go and do something else, and it causes a safety break for me and for you, or there's a rollback. I, 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 afterwards, it turns out, oh, no, I've got to roll this back, but you don't know that you've got to roll it back. So then I've got to communicate to you that you've got to roll it back too, and you're like, why? And I've got to give you proof of why. And then, yeah, but and then there are those overheads that we were just talking about, right? So what I'm hearing ultimately is you can kind of shard linearly in the sense of adding new shards increases more capacity. Each shard has its own consensus algorithm where it can locally kind of come to agreement. And then there's a separate consensus, um, separate consensus algorithm across all shards to come kind of to, uh, to agreement, uh, when there is a cross shard. Yeah. But the, that kind uh, of, um, that second, that second consensus of Cerberus, that that's not across all shards. That's just across shards where there's some state, right? So if, if me and you were involved in a transaction that was touching shards A and B, and then somebody else was involved in a tra transaction that touched shards, I don't know, T and S, we don't need to be in, in, a, in one of these Cerberus instances because they're independent, right? They don't touch, they have no overlap, they have no dependency on each other. So those, those Cerberus consensus um, processes are, they just include who needs to be included for the sake of this particular transaction. Now, if your transaction is extremely complicated and it touches all the shards on the network, then yeah, occasionally you will get a Cerberus consensus instance where everybody in the network is involved for whatever that is that transaction is doing. Um, but most of the in time, terms, you're going to be in terms you know, just small, small subsets of everybody. In terms of kind of traditionally, when I think of sharding, I think that potentially different shards could have different security properties. One shard has, say, a thousand nodes. Another shard has 10 nodes. How does Radex ultimately ensure that each shard has similar security guarantees? Uh, so there's a lot of... Um, so the first place to probably start, actually, is um, every piece of state in the network, whether, you know, that's, whether that's an account balance or, or some state for a smart contract or whatever, um, has what's called a state address, right? And the state address uh, space is fixed to 256 bits, right? So you've got 256 bits worth of possible state addresses, um, <clears throat> which is a lot, <laughs> as you probably know. Um, and the reason it's so many is obviously collisions, right? Reduce, reduce the likelihood of collisions. Um, although in this case, a collision isn't necessarily bad. It just adds a little bit of, of overhead, but the chances of getting a collision are ridiculously small anyway. Um, but that's, that, that state address space is fixed. So any piece of state that is created, um, there's not you know, the, 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 there's a hash that represents that piece of state, right? Or a hash identifier, at least, uh, called the state address. So you look at that hash and that tells you where in this in this address space that hash lives, right? Now, let's say we've got a really simple network where we only have um, two shards. So you, those two shards, one half of them, uh, one shard represents is responsible for maintaining one half of the, of the state address space and the other shard is responsible for the other, right? So given any state address at any moment in time, so long as I'm somewhat up to sync in terms of the last couple of epochs, I know who right now should be responsible for this piece of state, right? Which are the validators that are currently assigned to shard one? Which are the validators that are currently assigned to shard two? I have a tra transaction with some state that's mapping to shard two. I know who the validators are that are responsible for that. So I know that I need to send it to at least one of those validators, right? Maybe I send it to a couple just to be sure that it, you know, it gets there, and I haven't hit one that's just gone offline or something, right? Your, your usual kind of message reliability stuff that you would do. 
Um, now, if you kind of scale it up and you say, okay, well, now there's there's 10 shards because the network has grown, then this state address that I'm that I now have, okay, it's in one of these possible 10 shards because it's dynamically changed, right? There's more demand, so we need more shards for the throughput. So everybody's shuffled around and the number of shards has increased, et cetera, et cetera. But it still maps to the same place in the state address space. So, okay, now it, what used to be in shard two, but now it's in shard six, let's say. And because I'm fairly up to sync, I know exactly the validators that are responsible for shard six. So I can send this transaction to them. Um, and I'm assuming though each shard has its own quorum. Yeah, each shard has its own quorum. Yeah, yeah, it does. So, so how many? I mean, does as the network scale, does the quorum size for each shard stay the same, or is that dynamically adjusted? Could those be different? So, um, there's a there's an element of randomness on in terms of who what sh shard you're assigned to, right? So. Um, over a large enough sample set, you get small amounts of variation, but it's essentially random, right? So you get a fairly uniform distribution of number of validators in each shard group, right? Um, now, you, you obviously you might get you might have, but you will have situations where um, there's a lot of demand to be a validator in the network, so you, this additional computers joining, but there's not yet enough demand to warrant doing a shard uh, increase, right? Okay, so we're at 10 and everybody's pretty happy at 10, right? Nobody's sing signaling that they're constantly beyond their resource capabilities and stuff. So we're good with 10 right now, but double the number of validators come in because, you know, it's profitable for some reason, like fees or emissions or whatever it is. So those validators that join, <coughs> excuse me, I've had a bit of a, a, a flu over the past week. I'm at the end of my cough. So that's good that we're, no worries. Uh, it's we're, that time we're 30 of the year minutes where, in, I've uh, only coughed once, so that's definitely a good sign. You're good doing sign. good. Um, so, yeah, so, so you'll get these new validators that are coming in, but the network doesn't need to increase the number of shards yet. So, let's say that initially there is 100 validators in each one of these in each one of these shards, but you double. So, now on average, there's 200 in each one, right? That's fine because the local consensus can take care of that. Um, and there's some baseline that the network will want to kind of maintain, right? Whether that's 100, 150, 200, whatever, whatever, whatever the network decides is the baseline that it wants to maintain in these groups. Um, but at some point, then, if the if the throughput demand increases to a point where some of these groups are signaling, hey, you know, I'm getting a bit stressed on my resources here. I'm constantly 80 percent or 90 percent or something. Um, and then you, you eventually get a quorum that is saying, yeah, I'm beginning to get overstressed here. You know, I'm, I'm, I'm at 80% frequently. Um, then it might double the number of shard groups. And so those additional validators that came in, they all then, everybody then gets distributed fairly uniformly across now 20 shard groups instead of 10, right? Like it, it, and does the network just decide that dynamically, or how does that process? Uh, so the, there is a protocol um, that decides when this happens. Now you could modify it if you were an, adver an adversary, right, to try and get the network to do things. But that that protocol that signals these network topology changes is also kind of quorum driven, right? So so long as you are not breaching the, the the usual fundamental bounds of consensus, you know, two third majority is honest, then you can use that signaling mechanism as a means to grow or shrink the network as well. If demand has dropped off a lot or the number of validators has, has dropped in the network significantly, then you can also shrink the number of groups too so that you can get the, the per group um, validator count higher for security if needs be. So it can go both ways. So just to reiterate to make sure that I'm understanding correctly and for the audience with Radex, ultimately, I mean, in this example, there's 10 shards, uh, each shard has a hundred nodes and the throughput is not kind of a limiting factor. So if more nodes want to come onto the network, you would essentially increase the security of each mm -hmm. of the shards by going from a hundred full nodes to or 100 validators to 200 validators within that ecosystem or each shard if throughput does become a concern how the eco how radex ultimately adjusts that is makes new shards with additional 
uh, validator capacity that was on the network. And that can kind of happen dynamically to increase throughput uh, over time. But that would go back down to um, slightly less security or the original security guarantees with the 100 full nodes for each. Yeah, but what's interesting there as well in terms of the... The security dynamic of this is is interesting too, right? So, um, if we had ten um, ten groups and we had a hundred in each, right, and then those two hundred join, and so the security of the network is essentially doubled, right? Even though the throughput hasn't yet, um, and then the throughput goes up, and so we split into twenty. Then the per group security is back down to its original, right? But what's interesting yep. is is that almost everything in our network is a cross shard transaction, right? So if you've got 10 groups, then 90% plus of any transactions that happen are going to touch two, two groups, right? From my address to your address. Yeah. There is a probability that they'll, they'll be in the same group, but that's a one in 10 probability, right? Now, when the network then goes to 20 groups, then if me and you were just sending a simple transaction to each other, there's now a 95% chance that all of those kind of swap transactions are cross shard, right? So a greater percentage of transactions will be cross shard. So in the previous configuration where I sent you a transaction and it happened to be in the same shard, and so we were taking advantage of that 200 validator um, security metric, because the network topology has changed, there's a now an increased chance that I'm going to send you a transaction now and we aren't in the same shard anymore, right? So that will involve two shards, which we will still then benefit from 200 validators worth of security. Because it, instead of it being in the same shard and therefore the same validator set is responsible for both mine and your state, that's not the case anymore, right? Because the network has grown. So in a lot of cases, even though the network grows and the per group security metric decreases a much larger portion of transactions touch more groups and so therefore the number of validators that actually take part in processing that transaction is greater than it otherwise would be or at least the same as if it was a, you know a smaller a smaller group group count so maybe an example of currently how i understand it say my my assets were on chart one which has a hundred or 10 validators. If all of those 10 validators went offline, how d does the security, I mean, as my understanding, I wouldn't be able to access that shard if all those validators are offline until they come back on and restart the quorum. Is what you're saying different than that? Uh, yes. Although that is that is an, a good question as well. Right? So what I'm saying is, um, let's imagine that me and you are, are, are just in the network, right? Um, and someone is sending a transaction and both both pieces of that transaction you're responsible for. So you don't need to talk to me about that transaction, right? You can just process it locally. You, you don't need a Cerberus instance with more than just you in there because you're responsible for both bits, right? The, the from and the to, so you just do that. But then the network topology, the, the, the sharding topology changes because there's more demand, right? So now the two pieces of that transaction um, touch my shard and your shard, right? Now, in our shards, we both got 10 or 100 validators each, right? So previously, let's say you had 200 in your, in your group with you, that's now going down to 100 because the number of shards has increased. But that transaction now, because, because the, the address space that you're responsible for has shrank, then one of those pieces of state aren't in that address space anymore. It's, it's there, but you've shrunk to just be there. And I'm now covering this piece. So me and me and you have to yep. be involved in that transaction, which now means that two groups are involved, but so you get more uh, you, you get more transactional security, let's say, right? Because it's gone from having one group responsible where you might have had 100 or 200 or whatever, whereas now there's two groups which may have 100 each or 200 each, right? So yep. it's... I, I, I understand the logic. I guess I'm confused if just like my my shard and all the validators went well, That's a different line. problem, right? That's How a, that would... that's a liveness and data availability problem. And mm -hmm. like because if if you've all gone offline, then as long as you come back, you safety won't have been violated, right? So if you've 
if you're all in the same data center for some, you know, by some probability, and that, that data center lost its power, and then it came back up an hour later, nothing could have happened, right? Because there was no quorum to, to make things happen. You had no liveness. But everybody will come back and all of their state will be the same. So you won't have a safety issue. You, it's, it's a liveness issue. If they go away and never come back, sure. then it's still not necessarily a safety issue because nothing could have happened to change the safety of the data. But it, they're just not available, right? You start to then get a bit into the kind of realms of cap as well, right? Or it's not available. It's, they're yep. not petitioned. Yep. They're just not available. Yeah, they're consistent. They're not petitioned because yep. they've all gone, and but they're not available. Um, so make, that makes sense. In terms of maybe moving slightly around, when you go from one shard to uh, N plus one shards, you have... Uh, kind of these cross shard communication as we've kind of been talking about on a higher level, how does that affect kind of real world latencies from the user standpoint of that cross cart shard communication? Right. So um, your, <coughs> oh dear, there's a second one. I'm only, only five minutes after the last, I hope this is not going to get. Um, so because all of the groups that are involved with each other are kind of quasi synchronized, right? Um, and that synchronicity comes from the fact that I can't execute until I've got all of the inputs that I need from somewhere else. And you can't execute until you've got all of the inputs that you need from somewhere else, including from me, right? So provided that you have reliable message broadcast and provided that you have a, you know, above two thirds super majority of honest um, and not faulty actors, right? So faulty is like crashing or, you know, issues and stuff. Then we will all receive all the information that we need approximately within the same interval of time, like a second or so, right? So all the, so the transactions will execute across all of the validators that it needs to within a window of about a second or so. Um, and so that helps when you're looking at, okay, so if we've got a very complicated transaction, how much more latent is that transaction to completion than a simple one, right? Um, but because of the synchronicity and because of the mechanics of, you know, data broadcast and gossip and stuff, um, the jump in, in, in latency or finality going from one group to two groups and then the jump going from two groups to three or four groups is much less. It's, it's logarithmic in nature, right? Um, because of this kind of synchronicity and because we're using gossip and gossip is also logarithmic in, in terms of its uh, latency, right? I can, I can reach on, on every additional hop, I can reach a, an ever greater number of, of uh, recipients that receive this data, it's like gossip networks as a, a definition of virality, right? Um, so, um, so if you're just doing simple transactions you only, and you only need two groups, it's primarily driven by what is the local consensus? What is the interval of each phase for the local consensus? Um, and so in a, on, on, a, on a sufficiently geo-distributed you know, network, you're looking at maybe between 100 validators, you're looking at maybe a second to a second and a half, right, of this local consensus happening. Um, you've got two of them for a simple transaction, right? So, and they might be out of step a little bit. They might not be completely in sync because those local consensus processes are independent. So if you're, if, uh, if you're committing a proposal every second, then uh, those two processes can be out of sync by a second, right? I could just have committed mine as you're just starting the phase that was related to the one that I've just finished. So you can have a, a worst case latency there of about two seconds. Then you've got the cross shard stuff that happens, which is uh, minimal in terms of latency, right? Because that stuff happens um, based on the phase completion locally. So if I've just finished my phase and you're just starting yours, I don't care about that. I'm still going to send you what you need. You'll receive it. Oh, I'm not quite ready for it yet. I'll just cash it for a second while I finish this phase. Right now I'm ready for it. Now I execute. And then you've got another round, which is your, the commit round, right? Because I, I exchange stuff when I'm finished. Then you do a commit round. And again, there can be, you know, perhaps a latency worth of, of, of consensus phase. And because we're out of phase, maybe another second or so. So worst case, four seconds. If you're very synchronized in terms of the phases, um, then you can be down at, let's say, two seconds for two groups, right? So two seconds finality to four seconds finality for a two-shard group transaction. And that, that's that's 
completes final atomic. There's no probability that that is strictly yep. safe, right? Um, now, if you had, if you had another another group in, then you have the same kind of dynamics, but because um, if, the the phase interactions that we, that we were talking about and the additional kind of um, uh, communication and stuff, it doesn't actually add much more, right? Because there's only a, a, an upper bound of worst case that we can be out of phase by. And the more groups you have, the less that epsilon of error becomes. And so you can have, um, say, 10 groups and the finality for, for all 10 is only, say, seven and a half seconds or eight seconds, right? So even though you've got five times more complex transaction, the finality is only, say, three times as long, right? And then you add more groups and more groups, and it just, it just logarithmically flattens out. I see. So maybe if I could just pause here, because we've been nerding out for quite some time on like the consensus design and kind of some of the more minute details of how Radex works. But if, or maybe to just re-articulate it from the beginning, just to summarize it for the audiences, really Radex was created because of ultimately these systems will hit their limitations. You need to do some form of adding additional resources to the network. Radex is ultimately doing sharding where um, you can add additional shards to the network to increase overall network capacity. Uh, each of those shards can communicate um, across kind of the ecosystem. Uh, there is two, two, uh, two consensus algorithms, one more locally and one that ultimately can communicate uh, for the relevant shards for your transactions. Yeah. As you um, do the cross shard communication, there is some latency because there are physics right, in the exactly. world, but that is really upper bounded by logarithmic um, in terms of how much additional latency there is going to be. In yeah, that for, for a, a transaction of a particular complexity, yeah. Correct. Okay, cool. Well, maybe I know we've been nerding out that for a little bit, maybe moving on slightly. The conversation in the blockchain world today has really seemed to be centered around kind of um, single threaded virtual machines, particularly around the EVM and now more so to paralyzable virtual machines to be able to enable um, additional throughput. Can you talk a little bit about the Radex virtual machine and how you guys are kind of thinking about that problem space and kind of where you fall on the spectrum. Uh, yeah, I mean, we've been we've been thinking parallel execution for five years, if not if not longer, right? Like the Cerberus piece of the consensus, just parallel execution drops out of that. Right? As we were saying, right, you have these multiple instances that are doing executions. If those transactions aren't related to each other, and then you have a sequencer that determines the order for ones that are. Um, and parallel execution obviously is extremely useful um, because if you have a, a particular set of transactions that have some dependencies, then you can just you know put them into a, a, a thread of their own and they can just rattle through. Um, but if you then have a lot of other transactions that you know aren't codependent on each other, you can maximize the, the number of cores in the in the CPU, right? Or you can maximize I/O as well, even right if uh, if you have a really kind of responsive. Um, I/O system on on the machine that it's running on. Um, so I mean, par parallel execution is, in terms of its utility, a no-brainer, right? I mean, you just want to always squeeze out the maximum amount of utility for any box of resources that you have, especially if you're doing validation and you're you know you're mining or you're getting stake rewards or that kind of stuff, right? You want to you want to maximize the hardware you have so you can make it as profitable as possible. Um, but at the same time, there are a lot of complexities around um, around parallel execution, right? It depends very much on um, like the, the EVM or the, the VM that you're using plays a big part on one, is it possible even to how efficient is it to do it? Um, and a lot of that efficiency obviously comes around to like uh, lock contentions and stuff, right? Like if, if, if you do end up having some transactions where um, especially non-concrete transactions where some dependency wasn't known execution time but then the execution of, of that particular thing reveals that oh there's a dependency now right and that dependency means i've got to wait for that thing over there to finish because i can't make this parallel anymore um and yep. just those kind of like edge cases which 
even if they're rare, they can cause a bit of havoc, right? So, you know, suddenly you get a few of them and suddenly your your execution throughput goes from thousands a second to hundreds a second, right? Um, and again, a nice, a nice sweet spot for an adversary if he wants to come and play havoc with your network. Oh, if I do this, I can slow the execution from a thousand to a hundred. Okay, cool. Let's just pile the network full of these non-concrete transactions or whatever the, whatever the issue might be. Um, so finding efficient ways to make sure that you can you are you can run things in parallel and they stay parallel especially as transactions get more complicated you know with swaps and token swaps here and touching this component over there and doing this thing uh that becomes ever challenging um so it's it's, a, it's an interesting area of research um and it's an interesting area that, that we've focused on on a lot and it's one of those things i think where they will you, there's always going to be room for improvement, right? There's always optimizations. There's always um, improvements to the efficiency and also the security as well, right, of of the execution. And then you've got your kind of your baseline execution security as well around, okay, what actually is the virtual machine, right? How, how does that behave? Is it Turing complete? Is it object-oriented? Is it asset-oriented? Like, what are the constraints that it puts into play? Um some of those constraints may may prevent certain parallel executions in some cases, right? It, it just it just becomes a plethora of oh, okay, right. What is what is the sweet spot here for what we want to be able to do versus how secure do we want it, how fast do we want it, etc. So is today Radex uh, the virtual machine single threaded, and then kind of down the line exploring different ways to parallelize. Uh, the vm locally within yeah so at, at the moment our network is is single sharded essentially right um so sequential processing yeah within the we shard. kind of we kind of did things a little bit different to the way that everybody else seems so we wanted to be mega scalable right so we spent 10 years researching how to be scalable and then when we got the answer for that we said okay right now let's just put out a single sharded network because what's actually important before scale is developer experience, user experience, security, right? How good is the wallet experience? How like how difficult is it for for exploits to happen on this network so that users don't aren't getting drained every day and all that kind of stuff? There's no point having scalability if you haven't got the users, right? So even though we spent a lot of time on scale first and then the focus on the DevX, it's actually like the DevX, the user experience stuff that's gone out first, and then the scale, the scalability piece follows later on. So at the moment, we don't have any need for parallel execution because we don't have well, the user base in the network and the single shard aspect of what is Babylon um, has an upper bound throughput of maybe 100 TPS at the moment. And we know any of that anyway, so we don't even need to. Yeah, it, I mean, I fully appreciate that uh, kind of in my past life uh, doing product and engineering, um, you shouldn't optimize things for that don't don't exist yet. Right, it's um, like, yeah. So it's, it, and I always think of it as like, okay, yeah, we, we've built this rocket that can get to Mars, but sorry guys, we've kind of skipped on the life support a little bit and stuff, okay? It's like, but it'll be fine, don't worry. It's like, come on, you gotta look after that stuff first. <laughs> So maybe I kind of shifting from the virtual machine slightly, one thing that continuously is highlighted to me when talking with a lot of researchers and uh, builders and kind of the layer one, layer two ecosystem is this idea of data availability. Uh, whether if I'm talking with layer twos, they have to post that data back to the layer one or ultimately if you're a high throughput layer one, you're still bottlenecked by how much data you can really propagate mm -hmm. through the system. What is kind of the Radex goal or thinking around how to scale the data availability? I know we've talked in length about adding additional shards. Um, is it essentially just as we spoke about, uh, if each shard say has one megabyte capacity and there's 10 shards, then you have 10 megabytes of data availability and that can be scaled. Yeah, basically. Literally. Yeah. It's, it's, it, you, you, you get like, you just get this inherent piece of data availability, like not the complete picture, but yep. the bulk of it, just from, just from being able to do that, that linear scale that, that just automatically gives you you know, 80% of what you need, right? Um, and then all you've really got to think about is, okay, so 
what about in, in 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 certain edge cases like like you were saying earlier on what happens if that shard disappears right and how do you retrieve yep. the data for that well as we were discussing earlier um a large portion of transactions because of the way the state addresses work in the state the state address space uh, a huge majority like 90 95% plus of transactions will be cross shard right so you'll actually have two copies of that transaction and what it did and what the state transactions were in the network you'll have one on one of the shards and one on the other so to lose that transaction in its entirety you've got to at least lose two shards right um and the probability of that happening obviously reduces significantly um but then there's another factor as well in in the in the, in, in the Cerberus piece where every transaction also includes in that ephemeral Cerberus consensus instance, some random validators from around the network, right? They aren't even any, aren't in that shard. It's just, okay, you're randomly selected to just witness that this transaction happens. Um, and so then every transaction ends up in three or four or more shards. And it's very cheap for those witnesses because they're not actually doing consensus. They're just waiting for a commit event to happen and go, okay, I'll copy all those quorum certificates and I'll just keep them here um, for a period of time. And so you, you actually end up with many copies of that transaction across the network. It's all randomized because of the witnesses. So in order for you, your shard to be completely lost, a lot of stuff's got to go wrong, right? And if it's going that wrong, you've probably got bigger issues to worry about at that moment in time. Are there any issues with kind of scaling a single shard to say one gigabyte or 10 gigabyte? um in, right, in terms of data availability and ingestion and stuff like that i mean yeah just like yeah, I mean, yeah, yeah it's the same with with anything in this kind of system right you can go as fast as your slowest majority so if the slowest majority can do one megabyte a second then no matter how fast the machines are they're going to be doing one megabyte a second as well right that's true so, I mean, I guess, does the network have any minimum specs or recommendations on like upload? Download? Um, so I'm, when I'm doing my testing at the moment, um, which I'm not sure if you've seen any of the stuff I've been doing recently, which is quite interesting. Um, I'm doing all of my testing against a baseline spec of a four core, eight gigabyte with a SATA SSD. Um, and they are sharing, uh, a one gigabyte pipe between eight of them. Um, so they've got quite a lot of bandwidth, but um, that bandwidth is that if I was to max the bandwidth, the the the, the satellite would get max bottleneck before the bandwidth did, right? Um, do when when and this maybe leads me to my next question on like how you do storage. You, you can ultimately paralyze storage. Or state access with reads and writes. Yeah, I'm um, not doing any of that kind of stuff. It's just like, okay, what is the okay. lowest spec commodity hardware that I just want to baseline on, right? And like a four core eight gig um, SATA SSD is like commodity from about five years ago, right? Um, and um, recently on a network of those that, that spec machines, <clears throat> um, I'm actually going to do another one of these tests, hopefully today if I get the time. Um, Sharded uh, 16 shards um, was peaking out at 10,000 swaps a second. So this is this is swaps. This isn't like just your regular TPS that everybody goes, oh, yeah, we can do a million of them. Well, of course, they're, they're, they're not doing anything, right? Um, these are like pool swaps. So there's a pool contract, uh, multiple pool contracts, and we're doing, you know, I want swapping token A, token B, and it's a liquidity pool and everything. Uh, 10,000 of those a second across the network. and. I'm hoping to hit about fifteen to twenty thousand after some optimizations and stuff we've been working on. So, and that's all powered by these um, these you know these the baseline four core eight gig specs. But we we've done some testing in the past with the community, and uh, one guy joined with a Raspberry Pi, and he was also able to take part and and stay stay like pace the network for for you know a good portion of time as well. So. Um, until we got beyond about 200 transactions a second in the particular group he was in, he was able to to participate quite happily with the Raspberry Pi of all things. Um, Very cool. So, I mean, was the really the impetus for sharding 
uh, in your mind, really to keep those resource requirements kind of arbitrary low so that more validators could participate in yeah, the network? That, that, that's the motivation, yeah. Um, so that like, there's no friction to entry, right? Because if you've got friction to entry, then in my opinion, that increases centralization. There, there are arguments that say that it, it increases decentralization, but I don't, I don't believe that those arguments really carry any, any strength, right? If the, if, if the, if the barrier to entry is very low, then decentralization is, should be a byproduct of that, right? Especially if there is some incentives and the incentives then can be lower too. Oh, I've just got this Raspberry Pi that's cost me 30 bucks and I can join this network and I can participate. I'll get some rewards leave it running in the corner for weeks yeah brilliant i'll do that no problem um so yeah keeping the keeping the spec as low as possible um should hopefully promote decentralization and larger or, or at least larger numbers of uh, validators per group makes a lot of sense in terms of kind of the current narrative i feel like Obviously, ETH has really been their predominant smart contract platform. Now, I feel like the horizon is kind of expanding to kind of the newer blockchains, um, high throughput blockchains that really Solana pioneered, but also SWE, Aptos, say Monad. And I haven't as much, just from my opinion, have had heard Radex kind of in that conversation as a VC and kind of many other VCs watching this podcast, what would your um, kind of, what would you want them to take away from listening to this podcast on why they should either, either investors, engineers, those builders, what is your message to them to really look at the Radex ecosystem and say, Hey, we are actually a serious c competitor uh, you should take a look at what we're doing. Yeah, I would say that um, we've spent a long time doing things right um, from from our perspective, right? A lot of thinking, a lot of time and effort thinking about what are, what is the right way to do this. Um, and so I think if something is done in the right way, then from a, a user and developer point of view, um, it's a nice surprise. And you will see that if you look around you know, the Radix community as well. There's a lot of developers that really love the the script language, which is an extension of Rust and um, the whole developer experience. Uh, there's, there's so much positivity around how easy it is to just pick up and build um, and build safely as well, right? Like the, the, the chances of issue are, are hugely mitigated. Um, and, uh, you know, smart contracts, we've only had... Uh, script live on our platform uh just over three months now um even though we had a lot of betas we had three betas i think and an alpha when we were building this thing but we involved the developers a lot in the in the process of okay what, what do you want a smart contract platform to look like right we went and uh surveyed a lot of developers what's a big bugbear that, that you have with the evm or any other kind of um a smart contract platforms that that you're using and so we had got a lot of feedback and we took the time to 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 build that feedback and you know build solutions for that feedback into 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 the platform as well so obviously while we're doing that we're, we don't really want to go and hype it too much because you know we were still building right um but now that it's out in the wild um we had a good run of, of initial tvl as well i think our tvl is currently around 25 million um after after three months which um which isn't too bad um and we just really go after kind of the organic growth, right? We want to, um, we don't want a mob, you know, a flash mob to turn up and then they all disappear. And it's like, oh, where did everybody go? You know, we, we want to kind of build slowly an organic, strong developer community. Um, mobs are great for bull markets, but when the bear market comes, they've all gone, right? And obviously you want to, as a, obviously this is a long-term term vision, you know, I've been in this game for 10 years already, um, over 10 years now. Um, and so, you know, slow and steady wins the race, in my opinion. Makes sense. Yeah, it's, I'm fascinated just by how these different ecosystems work. Obviously, I really love uh, this conversation, learning the inner works of Radax, how kind of these different systems come together, how they make the different kind of trade-offs from either a hardware perspective 
a software perspective, how developers have to kind of learn how to adapt to that ecosystem and also to me, the users. And I think for me, it's just been a fascinating journey to kind of compare and contrast these different ecosystems to see what what may or may not work long term. So it's it's been a fun mm, journey. Yeah, I think I, I think the the biggest thing for me over this journey has been no compromise, right? So obviously, you know, you have to accept some, some trade-offs somewhere and you, you can't strive for perfection because it doesn't exist, but just no compromise. Don't compromise where you don't have to. If, if, if intuition is saying that can be done better, then, then have a look at it and try and do it better. And then you end up with, um, in my opinion, the, the strongest tech stack, um, especially for developers and and for, for overall user experience. And there's still quite a lot of it on the, on the milestone list to come as well over the next few months. And I'll just get, they'll just get more refined, easier to build on, easier for users to use. Yeah. And I, I think to that, if I maybe had to summarize my thoughts on Radex is ultimately you, you get linear scaling, which ultimately is yeah. the holy grail of all these ecosystem is to achieve linear scaling as you increase more resources to the network. But Radex uniquely allows kind of with sharding these lower resource nodes to participate in the network such that uh, really any hardware, so to speak, can be added to that network quorum and continue to increase capacity yeah. over time. Yeah. I mean, you know, eventually, who knows? Everybody might be running a Radix node in their uh, smart TV, right? I mean, imagine yeah. imagine that from a, a Nakamoto coefficient of decentralization. Everyone's TV is running a small uh, Radix instance. I mean, that'd be great. Well, Dan, uh, we've been nerding out for about an hour. Uh, we've gone through how Radix does, like their consensus design, how you guys ultimately um do touch on virtual machines how you guys do data propagation and ultimately storage is there anything that you feel like we didn't touch upon as we're kind of wrapping up um no i mean i i think we covered all, all the main points right it's like consensus scaling developer experience user experience um and th those things really are I suppose the kind of four pillars of 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 what we are focusing on anyway is, is, you know, those things. Um, so yeah, I think we've, I think we've done pretty good for a, for a first introduction. Likewise. Well, we'll, we'll wrap it up there and really appreciate you coming on the podcast no today, Dan. One. Appreciate you nerding out with me and, uh, it, it was, was a lot yeah, of fun. Yeah. Hopefully we'll do another one soon. Of course. Thank you again.